Hello, this is our scripture and sermon for May 10th, and we welcome you as you gather with us together as we worship and continue um, to be together while we are apart. Uh, a few quick announcements I want to make sure that everybody is aware of. We will continue to do these services just like this um, through the end of the month, and then assuming that we are still, um, still stay at home and not worshiping in person, we will be doing our Zoom worship again at the beginning of June on June 7th, so you can prepare for that. But every week between now and then, we will also be having coffee over Zoom every Sunday at 1030. That um, link does not change, so once you get it once, you have it for all eternity. It'll, it will be the same every week after that. Um, so join us as we come together just to talk and to be together as people of faith. But let us take and turn ourselves now to Scripture. Our first lesson this week comes from Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5 and 15 and 16. Hear these words. I take refuge in you, Lord. Please never let me be put to shame. Rescue me by your righteousness. Listen closely to me. Deliver me quickly. Be a rock that protects me. Be a strong fortress that saves me. You are definitely my rock and my fortress. Guide me and lead me for the sake of your good name. Get me out of this net that's been set for me, because you are my protective fortress. I entrust my spirit into your hands. You, Lord God of faithfulness, you have saved me. My future is in your hands. Don't hand me over to my enemies, to all who are out to get me. Shine your face on your servant. Save me by your faithful love. And our epistle lesson this week comes from 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Hear these words. Instead, like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word. Nourished by it, you will grow into salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now you are coming to him as, a, as to a living stone. Even though this stone was rejected by humans, from God's perspective, it is chosen, valuable. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus, it is written in scripture, Look, I am laying a cornerstone in Zion, chosen, valuable. The person who believes in him will never be shamed. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone. This is a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Because they refuse to believe in the word, they stumble. Indeed, this is the end to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Take my lips and speak with them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our minds and set them on fire. Amen. Not surprising given their permanence, stones play an important role as markers of faith. When Abraham and Sarah traveled, they would use stones to build altars at important points to celebrate what God was doing in their lives. And when the Israelites crossed the River Jordan into the Promised Land, they carried with them stones and built a monument to mark this occasion of how God had brought them through the waters. The stones took on even greater significance, perhaps, when they were used to build the temple in Jerusalem. 
as the home for God and the center of the faith traditions of the community. That same sense of permanence comes with a cost as well. When the Babylonian, during the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites felt diff, distant from their faith because the stones of the temple had been scattered and destroyed and they struggled to know how to praise God when they were so far from the walls where God had lived. Stones are great for marking things, they're great for building things, and they can give something a physical location, a place to go. Like we think of a gravestone that marks that place for us where our loved ones lie. But stones are not meant to be moved. If you want to see the grandeur of, say, Stonehenge or Mount Rushmore, you can't wait for it to go on tour like the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have to go and travel to England or to South Dakota to see these stones in their splendor. Now, when we think about building a temple to God, it would only be natural for us to think about our church buildings, which, of course, are often built with stones. Hamlin Church, where I grew up, had a beautiful stone sanctuary built in the Gothic style with soaring stained glass windows and wonderful artistry. Wilmer United Methodist Church, of course, has its own beautiful sanctuary with its um, striking contrast of red carpet and white woodwork. And these places create a sense of reverence and awe when you enter them. It's not hard to imagine that these are places where you can come to experience and know God. These are temples that are built to worship the creator of the world. But what's going on in our passage today in 1 Peter is something a little different. God is not calling on us to build another temple in Jerusalem, to build a temple out of stone. Instead, God is telling us that we are living stones and that we are we are going to be temples to God. And several things occur to me when I think about this. First, this changes how we think about worship and sacred spaces. Because now, because now any space becomes sacred by our presence. Second, now we need to think about ourselves and care for our own bodies. Because we have become places of reverence, do we act as temples to God? Excuse me. Finally, it serves as a reminder of God's willingness to choose us, those who are cast aside, and yet God will raise us up to be these temples of living stone. We are God's chosen people, even if no one else wants us. Like everyone else, I've been following the news around COVID-19 and the tough choices being made about when to reopen various parts of our communities as we try and strike a balancing act between risks of further infection and the economic and social costs of isolation. One of the touch points in this struggle is what to do about churches. There have been reports of churches seeking to reopen even before they're allowed by local governments, and these have often become media spectacles and showdowns. In 1 Peter, I think we see that such fights might not be necessary. Now, I love the sacred spaces we have in our churches, but the church is not the building, the church is the people. Each one of us is a living temple to God. Can we gather together in a sanctuary to God? Of course. Oh, certainly we can experience God's presence in the sanctuaries. But I wonder, though, if we would do better during these times of separation to look deeply at our own lives and see in ourselves the markings of God and how God has turned us into our own temples to celebrate the wonderful acts 
that God is doing in our lives and in the world. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm just really not good with languages, uh, I'll be honest with you. So I can't tell you anything profound about the phrase living stone and what it meant in the original Greek when it was written in 1 Peter. I can only tell you what I think of when I hear it in English. And two things come to mind. First, if we're meant to be living stones, then we are not static monuments that are stuck in one place or fixed for all time. We are living and growing and moving and thriving. Our faith, our salvation is not a static point in the time that we are celebrating. In that time we are celebrating, rather we are a testament to God's ongoing The second thing that comes to mind for me are caves. Over the last uh, year, my family's been on a couple of trips uh, to different uh, caves uh, down in Missouri and Wisconsin. And of course, you go into these caves and they have these wonderful rock formations. And of course, the rock formations of caves are often referred to as living stones because they're still growing. Stalactites and stalagmites are formed by water slowly adding more and more mineral deposits over thousands and thousands of years. Over time, these rock formations emerge and become more and more beautiful as these gradual deposits form these living stones. If we are living stones, then God is still working on us. Now today, as I mentioned earlier, is Mother's Day, a time when we honor the maternal figures in our lives and what they have done for us. And here's the thing about mothers. Being a mother is not a momentary event. Being a mother does not stop when a child is born. The act of feeding, nurturing, and raising a child is an ongoing process that does not end even when the child becomes an adult. But it's something you do. It's something you do for the rest of your life. In the same way God is a mother to us, always engaged in the ongoing work of feeding, nurturing, and helping us to grow throughout our whole lives, too. Just like a mother, God is not done caring for us. I was talking recently with one of our members, and they shared with me how important they found the scriptures and hymns at times like this. They told me how when they were lying awake at night, they'd be able to use these familiar passages they'd memorized over the years to give them peace and to help them deal with the stress we are all feeling right now. That, to me, is a wonderful example of being nurtured by the Word, as our text describes it. If we are living and growing stones, then we need to think about what we are doing to sustain that. We all know how important it is to feed a child good things. That's why a mother's milk is so important. It contains not only lots of great nutrients, but also the antibodies of the mother to protect a child from infection during those, few, those first few vulnerable months. Unfortunately, as we get older, we sometimes do not attend to what we put into our bodies. And I think the same can be said for our spiritual bodies. Do we continue to fill ourselves with healthy things as we grow in our faith? Or has that once healthy milk of the word been watered down or ignored? If you do not feed a child, they will not grow well. And the same is true with our own spiritual lives. 
we need to keep feeding ourselves spiritually so we can be living stones and beautiful temples of God. The idea of being a living temple to God is a bit overwhelming to you. Excuse me. If the, if the idea of being a living temple to God is a bit overwhelming to you, you are not alone. I must confess that the idea that everything I think and do reflects on my faith and how I follow God is a bit intimidating. When I worry about that, however, I'm forgetting something else. We are not building ourselves up as a temple. We are being built up by God. Think again of that image of living stones, rock formations in the cave. The stones do not grow themselves, rather they are bathed constantly with mineral-rich water, which helps the stones to grow. We do not grow on our own. We grow with God's help. God is like that water dripping over the stone, constantly bathing us in the waters of God's grace. In the Christian faith, baptism is a one-time act. This is when God sets us apart and marks us as one of God's children. This is the point where we go from being cast aside, a cast-aside stone to being a part of a holy nation, one of God's possessions. God's grace, however, is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing act, which is good because I, at least for one, am constantly in need of God's grace. Just like a rock formation, God is bathing me over and over again with grace and love, constantly showering me with blessings. And I believe that God is doing the same for you too. And over time, like living stones, we become testimonies to God. We are all becoming temples that tell the story of God's loving and redeeming work in the world. Our churches are beautiful expressions of our love for God. Our lives are meant to be as well. We know that it takes time and energy to make a beautiful building into a temple. Are we willing to put that time and energy to make our bodies into temples to God as well? Now, I do not mean we all need to physically be physically fit. Our temples reflect an inner beauty, not some externally generated one. God sees us with the eyes of a mother and knows our true beauty. So let us be living stones. Let us be washed and shaped and formed by God's grace. Let us know that the love of God, like the love of a mother, surrounds us and nurtures and sustains us. And let us turn ourselves into temples to God and testimonies to God's work in the world.